afternoon. How are we? Good. Okay, how many people I've met before, by the way? Who's been on JWRP? Any JWRP ladies? Okay, I'm also the head tour guide for that. I'm not going to do a whole introduction because you can read about me. My mother wrote the introduction, by the way. And we're short on time, as is I tend to talk too fast. So uh, we're going to skip it, but just very briefly, as you can tell, I'm not originally from this part of the world. I'm from New York, but I went to Israel for three months and ended up staying for 35 years. And in Israel, I work as a, I am a rabbi, I have the smicha, but I don't work as a rabbi. I work primarily as a historian and a licensed tour guide in Israel. I wear two hats. I wear the hat of a rabbi and a historian, and I like to synthesize them together, both in terms of understanding the past and also in terms of uh, what's going on in the world today. A little caveat about what we're going to do now, it's not exactly as described in the brochure. We are going to talk about the UN resolution, but I want to pull back and give a little bigger perspective in which we have a lot more context to, what, context to what's going on in the UN and the UNESCO, uh, what we had recently, and also with that famous 2334 resolution. It's going to appear in the middle, but just to focus on that, I, I think would lack the context and the meaning that we need to have. So the presentation I'm going to do, it's actually entitled, A Nation That Dwells Alone, Why Does the Entire World Pick on Tiny Israel? A little background to this. For those of you, who here is a Zionist? Okay, good. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Okay. You know, the, joke, the joke definition of a Zionist is a Zionist is someone who lives in the diaspora and gives money to the Jewish agency to convince someone from a third world country to go live in Israel. <laughs> but I'm a real guy. I live in Israel, I served in the army, all my kids did, thank God. Um, but if you study the history of Zionism, common theme of all early writers over 100 years ago was that we stuck with this phenomenon of anti-Semitism, and the reason why we can't ever get rid of it is because we're not a normal nation. Universal belief held by all, all these thinkers, when we have a state, a passport, an army, someone to protect and represent us in the world, like every other nation, then anti-Semitism will cease. You can see here a quote from Theodor Herzl, who's not the founder of Zionism, but definitely the driving force behind it. Can everyone see the screen, by the way? Is this blocking you? A little bit? Okay, I hope you can see it. I would have moved this over, but I don't think I can personally will fall off the stage. But you're welcome to... What does Herzl write? I can't even see what's written. Here it is. It says, the Jewish question still exists. It would be foolish to deny it exists wherever Jews live in perceptible numbers. It is a national question which can only be solved by making it a political world question to be discussed and controlled by the nations of the civilized world in council. A wondrous generation of Jews will spring into existence. We, will, shall, we shall live at last as free men on our own soil and die peacefully in our own home. When you read this, you can almost cry. What Herzl's saying is when we have a Jewish state, anti-Semitism will cease. Herzl died in 1904. Fast forward to 2017. And the number one excuse for hating Jews in the world today is what? Israel. You guys see it here, I'm sure. Not that it's the cause, don't get me wrong. What I want to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is look at 10 unique ways the world looks at Israel. I'm sure all of you are aware of some of these. You've seen them all here and there. You've never seen them all together. A mere 40 minutes from now, you're going to be looking at this list and going, oh my god, it's unbelievable. By the way, if I, if I just stopped by showing you the list, you'd all need Prozac as you left the room before lunch. <laughs> but every cloud in Judaism, even the darkest clouds, have a silver lining. And what I'm going to do is flip it over at the end and put what I believe is the real message, not just on that UN vote 2334, but what's really going on with the incredible double standard the world has for Israel. So each of these ten points, except for the last two of them, begin with Israel is the only country in the world that. And we're going to touch on each of them briefly. And then put them all together and try and understand like, what is really going on here on the deepest level. So number one is Israel is the only country in the world whose national identity has been labeled racist and illegal. What I'm talking about here is the famous uh, UN General Assembly vote, which took place in November 1975. It's not to read all of this, but just look at the, the vote at the bottom. The final resolution determines that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. Do you guys realize this is unique in human history? Only time in the history of the United Nations, or arguably in all of human history, that a people's national identity was called illegal and racist. By the way, the only thing set more miraculous than this was the fact that Israel was able, decades later, to garner enough support in the UN to actually rescind this. I'm sure that's the last time it's ever going to happen in the United Nations. 
This is Reverend Benjamin Nunez, who's the UN delegate from Costa Rica, a country that is historically very friendly to Israel. He says, what a tragic paradox that the Jewish people, with its ideal of Zion, the greatest victims of racism and racial persecution throughout history, is now, by virtue of a draft resolution of the Petro majority, a racist people in a movement. So number one, a weird aspect. Being Zionist is simply illegal. Number two, Israel is the only country in the world whose very existence is threatened, and the sentence was too long to stick in the PowerPoint, but whose existence is threatened by another member state or multiple member states of the United Nations. That, by the way, is illegal to do. Part of being in the UN is the idea you don't threaten other countries with extinction. And those other states not only openly do it, but they're not sanctioned for doing it. There's a lot of conflicts going on in the world today all over the place, internal struggles, border wars, but the only country in the world whose existence is being threatened continually is the Jewish state. Who's threatening us today most? Iran. But it's not something new. Iran's just the, the newest part on a very long list. And if we look at statements made in the last, let's say, 70 years or so, this is Azam Pasha, Secretary General of the Arab League, May 15, 1948, the day after Israel declares itself a state. This will be a war of extermination, a momentous massacre which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacre and the Crusades. He's proud of it. This is the voice of Arab radio, May 18, 1967, a few days before the start of the Six Day War. The sole method we shall apply against Israel is total war, which will result in the extermination of Zionist existence. This is Ayatollah Ali Khamenei of Iran, this is 1991. Israel is a malignant tumor in the region, it must be cut off, it must be eradicated. The next one is the scariest, because this is Egyptian press, which is a country that A, has a peace treaty with us, Israel, and, and uh, now, pretty unbelievable when you see this board. There is columnist Ahmed Rajab al-Akbar, and this is state-controlled media, not just some guy voicing his opinion. Thanks to Hitler, blessed memory, on behalf of the Palestinians, revenge in advance against the most vile criminals on the face of the earth. Although we do have a complaint against him, for his revenge on them was not enough. This is a country of diplomatic relations with peace treaty. And here's our good friend, former president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Know that the criminal and terrorist Zionist regime, which is years of plundering, aggression, and crime to its name, has come to the end of its road and will soon be wiped off. The Zionist regime reached a total dead end. With God's grace, your wish will soon be realized, and this germ of corruption will be wiped off. So we see it's a theme, not just from Iran, but the whole Arab Middle East has been calling for the destruction of Israel since its inception and even before there was a Jewish state. The question we've got to be asking ourselves, and not all these pictures are Arabs, this is people in Europe. What is the thing we are doing that is considered so evil that the whole world has their gun sights on us and feels we need to be removed from the face of the earth? Number three. Israel is the only country in the world whose capital, which by the way in parentheses is missing from the screen, is arguably the oldest continuous capital of any people on the planet Earth, is not recognized by any country, which by itself is just a crazy idea. How can you not recognize another country's capital as capital? How do you recognize a country's capital diplomatically? What's the move that one country does to another country? You place your embassy there for the ambassador lives. Okay. Now, prior to this, now specifically what I'm talking about is a famous Security Council resolution. Now, we just had this famous 2334 resolution in the last few weeks of Obama's tenure as president. What's the difference between Security Council resolutions and General Assembly resolutions? Anyone know? Much more serious. Security Council is a much smaller body, but resolutions of the Security Council are binding on all member states. You have to follow them. General, General Assembly resolutions are just statements. So this is serious stuff, and this is in a reaction to, remember, we're, gonna, we're coming up very soon to the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War, when Israel, for the first time in 2,000 years, you know, we said, Har Habayat Jerusalem, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Israel unilaterally declared, after the 67 war, that Jerusalem is the internal, indivisible capital of the Jewish people. It was a unilateral move. And, of course, the Nations of the world objected to Israel one-sidedly making that move. So the Security Council passed a resolution. Just look at the red part at the bottom. Affirms that the enactment of the basic law by Israel constitutes a violation of international law. Number five, decides not to recognize the basic law and such other actions by Israel that as a result of this law seek to alter the character and status of Jerusalem and calls upon A, 
all member states to accept this decision. B, those states that have established diplomatic missions at Jerusalem to withdraw such missions from the holy city. So this is done in uh, 1980. Prior to the resolution, only 16 countries in the world that had their embassies in Jerusalem. By the time you get to the mid-1990s, not one country in the world maintains its embassy in Jerusalem. Where are all the embassies? In Tel Aviv, on your home street. By the way, America maintains multiple consulates in Jerusalem. I actually wrote in a letter to Obama when he was president saying, you got a $20 trillion budget deficit, maybe close one, save a few million dollars a year. Drop in the bucket. But do people realize how insane that is? How, everyone knows chutzpah, right? How chutzpah it is? Most non-Jews can't even say that word. <laughs> to tell the country its capital is not its capital? Crazy stuff. Unique, unique. By the way, the most pro-Israel political body in the world is not the Knesset. What is it? The United States Senate and Congress, by far. So in reaction to that Security Council resolution, albeit a number of years later, this is Jerusalem Embassy Relocation Act, October 23rd, 1995. Look at how the vote went, it's unbelievable. 93 to five in the Senate for it, and 374 to 37 in the Congress for it. No Knesset vote ever goes that lopsided. But look what it says at the bottom, you can see. It says the United States maintains its embassy in the functioning capital of every country, except in the case of our democratic friend and strategic ally, the State of Israel. And the actual resolution on the timetable is the United States Embassy in Israel should be established in Jerusalem no later than May 31st, 1999. Now you notice it hasn't happened yet. If you're watching the news, one of Trump's promises was to move the embassy. Trust me, guys, this is my prediction. I'm not a prophet. If I was, I'd be working in the stock exchange. But it's going to be a heck of a lot easier for Donald Trump to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico than to do this. This is one of the few he may not actually do. We'll see. We'll meet again next year, see if I'm right or not. We'll see. But do you guys realize how strange that is? You tell the country it's capital, it's not its capital, but that's exactly what happened. Okay, let's keep moving. Israel is the only country in the world that has given its holiest site to another religion, and if I can add that sentence, make it a little longer, that not only doesn't say thank you for being so incredibly nice, but now claims that it is even a Jewish holy site. Now, first of all, we have to clarify. What is the holy spot in the world for the Jews? Some Jews think it's a buffet table. <laughs> okay. Jews in America think it's in Brooklyn somewhere. A lot of Jews erroneously think it's this place over here. How many of you guys been to Israel? Let me see again. Wow. Who owns a house there? Anyone? Too expensive. The French are getting all the good apartments. Okay. I'm blessing you that the ranch should go way up in value. You can all show by real estate there. But the, a lot of people think it's the Western Wall. The Western Wall has no intrinsic holiness. I don't want to do a class on where the Western Wall becomes a holy site. But all it is is part of a retaining wall that was built by Herod the Great or one of his descendants in around 2,000 years ago. Here's a better view of it. You can see from the top down. By the way, the Western Wall is this. That's the plaza right there. Okay? This huge platform, the world's largest, the Temple Mount platform, the top of Mount Moriah. Largest man-made platform on the planet Earth, by the way. A trapezoid 500 meters by 300 meters. Okay, but it's not the holiest spot. The holiest spot is where? Who knows? Underneath that gold dome. A great book by Yossi Klein Alevi called Like Dreamers. It's a story of six paratroopers who all became famous people in Israel afterwards. Some of them are left-wing, some of them are right-wing. But they liberated the old city in 67. They talk about how the paratroopers came in from the Lion's Gate over here, entered the Temple Mount. They're running around up here asking where the Western Wall is. It's kind of funny, because even Israelis didn't know that the holy spot is up there, because what used to be there, that, I'm hoping when I get back, we'll see it there. In which case, you're all invited for one big party. But that's the temple, which for 830 years stood on that spot. When does it first become a holy spot for us? When? What's the, what's the first association? Bible trivia, who knows? Genesis chapter 22, the binding of Isaac's story. Now to reference that UN Resolution 2334, which I don't want to go into the whole explanation of that, but what it essentially did was change the, the whole terms of from three, 243 and 338 after 67, which did not talk about specific territories. 2334, the most recent resolution, basically says that any territory taken by Israel, including Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount, is occupied territory. 
along with the UNESCO resolution you guys are familiar with, which basically dejudaized the city. But this is the spot underneath that gold dome is where the Holy of Holies of the Temple stood. That's the spot in Jewish tradition where Abraham brought Isaac and the binding of Isaac story in Genesis chapter 22. People always ask me why that spot. I always say, ask God. I don't know. But for whatever reason, that place is the ultimate nexus, the meeting point between the physical and the metaphysical. It's the place where you can naturally connect spiritually better than any place on the planet Earth. To use internet terminology, it's like the ultimate hotspot for spirituality. And therefore, the place to build the holiest object in the Jewish world, which is what? The temple, the Beit HaMikdash. So for 830 years, there's a first and second temple on that spot, with a little 70 year break in the middle for Babylonian exile. And even though in the last 2,000 years, we haven't had the, the, a temple there, it is intrinsically holy to the Jewish people, with or without a Jewish state or Jewish control of Jerusalem, which is why wherever we are in the world, we're always praying towards Israel. In Israel, where are we praying towards? Jerusalem. And when you put Jerusalem, where you pray towards? That place, which is mentioned how many times in the Hebrew Bible? 667 times. We're Jerusalem obsessed. You know, like you break your glass at a wedding? The woman thinks that's because it's the last time the guy gets to put his foot down. No. It's because you can't have total joy without the temple being rebuilt. How many times in the Quran does Jerusalem appear? Zero. Zero. When I'm, when I'm speaking at a university campus in America, I say that. A Muslim student always starts arguing with me. I take out a Quran. I hand it to him. I always have one. He doesn't. And I said, if you can find Jerusalem in here, I put a hundred dollar bill on it. And I said, you get the money. If you can't, you only have to give me 50 back. They always chicken out, but then I have them read Surah 5, chapter 5, verse 21, where there's a direct reference in the Quran to giving the land of Israel to the Jewish people. You, never, you ever notice the Ayatollahs never quote that one? There's no Islamic mention of Jerusalem for Muslim. Nonetheless, there is an Islamic holy site from the 7th century connected to a story of Muhammad's midnight ride. I don't want to go into it now, we don't have time. But the point is for us, Jerusalem may be holy to the three monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but it's only holy to the Jewish people. In fact, there's no debate there. But the most amazing part of all of this is after 2,000 years of having no Jewish state and no control of Jerusalem, and then in 1967, for the first time getting the Temple Mount back in our hands, we went and gave control of our holiest site to the Muslim religious trust, the Waqf, which is W-A-K-F. But not only do they not say thank you, what they say now is pretty unbelievable. This is Dr. Marwan Abu Khalaf, Director of Archaeological Studies at Al-Quds University. Now remember, the context of this is this is post-Oslo 1993 Accords. Part of the Oslo Accords was both sides, Jews and Palestinians will recognize each other's historic and you know, religious connection and claims to the land of Israel and to Jerusalem, the Holy City. And even though our claims are much older and much deeper, and we've actually given our holiest site to them, their reaction is even more extreme. He writes, the archaeological treasures in Jerusalem emphasize the depth of the city's heritage and history. They emphasize its Arabness and refute the Israeli claim that it is a Jewish city. It is known that perhaps under every stone, in every corner, on every street, in every turn in Jerusalem, there are relics. These relics say we are Arab, we are Muslim, we are Christian. What's missing from that? Jew. No, no such thing. It's all a Zionist myth. <clears throat> Look at, this is Dr. J Jamal Amar, lecturer of urban planning, Beirzeit University, 2009. Yeah, this is an interview taking place on action on TV. There is a view that where the Dome of the Rock stands is the Holy of Holies of the fictitious temple. And by the way, it is merely an illusion. There is not a remnant of it. It is a myth, a story of no value. Like the Arabian Nights and other legends, only in Palestine, after 60 years of digging, they have found nothing at all. Not a water jug, not a coin, not an earthen vessel, no bronze weapons, no piece of metal, absolutely nothing of this myth because it is a myth and a lie. This digging has not left a single meter unturned, but has achieved absolutely nothing. Therefore, by means of these myths, they want the fictitious temple to replace the mosque of the Dome of the Rock. How many of you guys been to Israel and seen some archaeology from, you know, everywhere, every stone and every rock we turn under, what does it show us? Thousands of years of Jewish connection that predate Islam. You know, when Joshua came into the land of Israel, it was 1900 years before Muhammad was even a thought in his mother's mind. This is crazy. By the way, they ripped the page right out of whose playbook? Adolf Hitler. 
is a great lie. He said, people are much more likely to believe a big lie than a little one. This is Sheikh Tasser Rajab Tamima, Ph. Islamic judge. This is, he's like the chief rabbi of the Temple Mount for that. I like to keep up. He says, Jerusalem is an Arab and Islamic city and has always been so. Excavation work conducted by Israel since 1967 have failed to prove the Jews had a history or presence in Jerusalem or that their ostensible temple had ever existed. And ladies and gentlemen, today there is not one PLO official, not one historian, not one map, not one textbook that will ever admit that there was ever a presence, a Jewish presence in the land of Israel or Jerusalem prior to Zionism. It's all Judaizing myths of the Jews who are foreign occupiers that are using it to usurp the land and the holy sites from the rightful indigenous inhabitants of the Palestinians. By the way, just to show you how crazy it is, I found this. I was speaking in Australia a couple years ago, and a guy came up to me and he said, my father fought in the Anzac forces. He was stationed in, in Jerusalem, like between World War I and World War II, when there was British mandates. So he brought me a copy. I thought I actually copied it. This is the Muslim tourist guide to the site, Al Harapa Al Sharif, the noble sanctuary. This is put together by the Muslim religious trust. It's dated 1930. Remember what they're saying now? There's no Jewish connection to Jerusalem. Look at what it says here. I'm sorry, you most of you can't read it, but it's, this is page three. Its sanctity dates from the earliest, perhaps prehistoric times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. This too is the spot, according to universal belief, on which David built their altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. You know what they say? Like, the admissions of one's own mouth are better than a hundred people testifying against you. The point is they've really changed their tune. But the notion that you can call a people's capital, if not their capital, and their holy sites were never their holy sites is unbelievable. And what they say now is the Jews are attempting to Judaize the city, which is pretty hysterical. It's like accusing the Pope of trying to Catholicize the Vatican. Or like the, you know, the guys in Saudi Arabia who are trying to Islamicize Mecca. It's an, we've given another people our holiest site, and all they're trying to do is deny that it was ever ours in the first place. Anyway, it's unique, uniquely depressing. Israel is the only country in the world that's consistently singled out for criticism and condemnation, not just by the UN, but by a multitude of NGOs around the world. A couple of examples, by the way, and I should have added Syria in here. Presentation is a little bit. I updated a few things in here, but if, these are a few real serious major human rights you know, tragedies that have taken place in the last couple decades. Remember the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s? Killed two million of its own people. 1990-1995, civil war in Liberia, 800,000 people die and half the population exiled. Sierra Leone, 1991-1996, 50,000 dead, half the population displaced. 1998, five countries invade the Congo. By 2001, two and a half million people have died, the greatest loss of life in any conflict since World War II. Took till 2003 for the UN to send a serious French force. That's what's known as an oxymoron. They probably landed and surrendered. Anyway, and then we have Syria. Four years of civil war, over half a million people dead, and half the population displaced. What did the UN do in any of these situations? What do you think? Nothing. But when it comes to Israel, <clears throat> constantly under a state of threat, here's the most recent statistics. Look at this one. Geneva, November 25th. This is from UN Watch, the website. Any of you guys visit the website? It's a great website to track the UN's voting record on. The UN General Assembly's 2015 session is adopting 20 resolutions singling out Israel for criticism, and only three resolutions on the rest of the world combined. Pretty incredible. Not a single UN general resolution this year is expected to be adopted on gross and systematic abuses committed by China, Cuba, Egypt, Pakistan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Yemen, Zimbabwe, or any dozen other perpetrators of gross and systematic human rights violations. That the world obsesses on Israel is a point I'm sure you all know. By the way, this is a list of the countries that are in the UN Human Rights Council. This is hysterical. It's like putting Adolf Hitler on the Jewish Pride Committee. You know, Saudi Arabia. By the way, they, have, they sit on the Council for Women's Rights. A country where a woman cannot drive and can't go in public without a male relative escorting her. And has to walk around like with a hole in you know, Incredible. Qatar, you know, Venezuela, Cuba, Egypt. Unbelievable. No wonder they're condemning us. You can see, by the way, there have been more resolutions condemning Israel in the last 40 years than every other country in the world combined. It's mind-blowing. Israel is the only country in the world 
that is attacked and condemned for responding even with great restraint. And by the way, that wins wars and doesn't start for its own survival and self-defense, and then is treated as if it's the aggressor and actually lost the war. And you can see that great example, Do you guys remember that second Lebanon war in 2006, when Israel already pulled out of Lebanon at a buffer zone there from 1982 to the year 2000. We pulled out, even the UN admitted Israel did not occupy any Lebanese territory. But you remember, who remembers that event? It was pretty horrible. The last, uh, two Humvees full of reservists were attacked on the border by Hezbollah. All the guys in the first were killed by a missile. Apparently all the guys in the second were probably also killed. But Goldwasser and Regev, these two guys in their 30s, young married men, reservists, on their last day of reserve duty, were either mortally wounded or dead already. They took their bodies across the border as well, unleashed a massive artillery barrage on Israel to cover their escape. When you fire across a border at another country's military forces unprovoked, or launch an artillery barrage on civilian population, according to international law, what is that? It's called causes belly, an act of war. Completely unprovoked attack. Hezbollah is completely to blame, yet look at the reaction of the world is mind-blowing. Here's the UN. It says, look at this. This is Jan Englund, who's still around doing damage. A top United Nations humanitarian official said the Israeli response is a violation of international law. Look what he says now. He was equally critical of Hezbollah and Hamas for abducting Israeli soldiers. Equally. They started the whole thing. He also said that those who had seized Israeli soldiers and fired rockets into Israel from southern Lebanon bore their share of the blame. Are you kidding me? They bore 100% of the blame. This is, I call them Amnesia International, I mean, Amnesty International. I love this one. The report also states for Israel to preserve the principle of proportionality, even if the destroyed objects could serve as dual purpose, meaning they're deliberately launching rockets from hospitals and people's homes, which is a war crime in and of itself. It calls for an independent and impartial inquiry appointed by the UN, another oxymoron. This idea of proportionality is only applied to Israel. What does proportionality mean, guys? In asymmetrical warfare, which is all the conflicts in the world today, like the U.S. fighting Afghanistan, the Taliban, the Taliban have an air force, do they have a navy? They don't have anything. They got a lot of um, whatever. <clears throat> what Israel's being told in here is, you have better weapons than they have, so you're not allowed to use all of yours. Do you know, by the way, in the last Gaza war, which my second oldest son, my oldest son fought in the first Gaza war. He was a sniper and a medic. Isn't that a great combination of jobs? Second time was a reservist. 38 days he was in that war. The scariest 38 days of my, my wife and my, and my life. We talked to him maybe for three minutes in 38 days the whole time. <clears throat> During that war, when Israel had the Iron Dome missile system, remember that? You know, a European parliamentarian demanded that Israel share it with Hamas. No, I wasn't joking. It's not fair. You have better weapons. Or the, here's, the, here's the European Union. Okay? This proportionate use of force by Israel and Lebanon in response to attacks by Hezbollah on Israel, I was talking about it, is they're greatly concerned about it. The imposition, I'm sorry, it's a spelling error, of an air and sea blockade on Lebanon cannot be justified. Meaning in a time of war, you're not allowed to impede the flow of weapons and troops into your enemy's territory. You guys realize these are standards that are only applied to Israel and no one else in conflict. No one else cares when anyone else is doing it, but when Israel does it, crazy. Look at how many rockets were fired in Israel, up to Hamas taking over. Over a thousand, this is in the first Gaza war, between 2008 and 2009, when the war starts over here. If you fire a thousand mortar and missile rounds into civilian population, it's an act of war, right? Has anyone been to stay wrote? Every bomb shell, every bus stop is a bomb shelter. All the kindergartens are reinforced with concrete. Half the population is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, going to live in a constant state of fear from missiles hitting. So clearly, Israel pulls out of Gaza, gives it to Hamas, or gives it to the PLO. Hamas takes it over and starts launching attacks against Israel. When Israel responds against the world's reaction, is mind-blowing. Here's response to Castle in December 2008. The UN Human Rights Council, blah, 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 it says, Look at the second paragraph. Strongly condemns the Israeli military attacks and operations in occupied Palestinian territory, particularly the recent ones in occupied Gaza Strip, which have resulted in the killing and injuring of thousands of Palestinian civilians. This is not true. Including a large number of women and children. Look what it says now, guys. Also condemns the firing of crude rockets on Israeli civilians. Is this unbelievable? What's the implication? You know, they also during the last war, 
a couple of European parliamentarians called them firecrackers. Now Israel has the Iron Dome. How much does an Iron Dome missile cost? It's to intercept these crude firecrackers. What does a Katusha rocket cost to make? 50 bucks, 150 bucks. What does an Iron Dome missile cost to make? $40,000. It's a lot of rand. Don't even try and calculate it. They use them to shoot down the missiles. No. This stuff is crazy. The lopsided, so the Israelis being targeted doesn't count. By the way, one of the heroes of this whole uh, UN inquiry was Richard Kemp, who was a, who was a, who was a colonel, retired, former NATO commander in Bosnia, one of the few people to testify in Israel's favor, but he says it like it is, one of the only people to say the truth. Based on my knowledge and experience, I can say this, during Operation Cast Lead, the Israeli Defense Forces did more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any army in the history of warfare. You hear this coming out from anyone else, guys? Never. Okay, by the way, it's so bad, the, the media coverage is so lopsided and so distorted. If the New York Times and the media today were to cover the Holocaust the way they cover Israel today, this is how the headlines would probably look. Warsaw ghetto uprising and overreaction. European leaders blame Jews for disproportionate response. Jewish resistance shatters hopes for a peaceful final solution. Again, this is kind of like warped humor, but this is not too far off the way the world is covering what's going on. Israel is simply not allowed to defend itself. And the level of attacks against Israel is no more sensible, logical, or rational than what happened in medieval Europe a thousand years ago when we were accused of drinking Christian babies' blood to use it to make matzah. Remember that stuff, blood libels? Look at this is Saudi Arabian press, January 5th, 2011. Saudi media reported on Tuesday that a vulture tagged with the words Tel Aviv University had been detained for being a Mossad spy. A report in the Saudi paper al Miam claimed that the vulture bearing a leg bracelet and transmitter apparently placed by Israeli bird scientists studying migration patterns had, found, had been found in the rural area of the country. The paper said the flight appeared to be, quote, a Zionist plot, unquote. The report triggered a plethora of posts on Arabic websites claiming that, quote, Zionists had trained birds for espionage. The South Sinai governor last month suggested that a shark that killed a tourist in Shalma Sheikh had been intentionally released by the Mossad to sabotage tourism in the area. You should read this on forum when you're drunk. You laugh a little. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to show you another T-shirt I made at the end. But I'm going to make a new T-shirt. It's going to have this on it. <laughs> you know the saddest part of all of this is anyone believed half of what they say about us, no one would mess with us. Would you mess with people who control the world's economy, seismic activity, solar flares, the animal kingdom? <laughs> I wouldn't touch these people. Okay, let's keep going. Israel is the only country in the world that is expected to and sends aid to an enemy during war. This one is pretty crazy. But during this, by the way, is a fake press conference that the Ishmael Hanya, who's the head of Hamas in Gaza, that guy with the beard, this was filmed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they closed the blinds and claimed that Israel had cut off all the power and were having a meeting by a candlelight. All the press knew exactly what was going on, yet they took pictures of this and sent this out that Israel's turned off the power. The reality is the exact opposite. Here's the Israeli government response to it. During the military operation, this is cast led in 2008-2009, Israel ensured the delivery of the following 59,280 tons of humanitarian supplies and 2,281 trucks, 3,604,250 liters of fuel conveyed through Nahal Oz and Karim Shalom. This is during the fighting. By the way, at the same time, Israel has power lines that go directly into Gaza. They get free electricity. Why? Because they don't pay for it. You know how much money the Palestinian Authority and Hamas owes Israel Electric Corporation? It's well over a billion shekels in unpaid bills. Crazy. I don't pay my bill for three days. I get this warning cut off notice. They got to hook up to these guys. They get a better deal for me. Again, Richard Kemp. He said, during the conflict, the IDF allowed a huge amount of humanitarian aid into Gaza to deliver aid virtually into your enemy's hands is, to the military tactician, normally quite unthinkable, but the IDF took on those risks. That's the reality. Again, totally distorted. We don't see any of it. Israel is the only country that's expected to, and actually evicts its own citizens and destroys communities that it built. And this, of course, goes back to, you guys remember in 2005? Not everyone remembers that. Remember when Ariel Sharon was head of the Likud? And they did this deal where they evicted. Now, do you remember this? This was the most traumatic thing I lived through in Israel. 
watching that they send these, look at the pictures here. These are the soldiers sent in to evict the people in their houses, and they're crying, and they're hugging each other. It was unbelievable that they destroyed, they, they pulled all the Jews out of these beautiful communities in Gaza, which is a very ancient Jewish community. Wealthy Jews in America bought all the hot houses from these people to give to the Palestinian Authority to use for like the bug-free lettuce. What did they do as soon as the Jews left? They destroyed everything, and then there was a civil war in Gaza where Hamas fought the PLO. Beat them, threw them out, killed a lot of them, turned the whole thing into this. This is what you got. They are just from Hania with a little look at this. Like a little like, kid dressed as a suicide bomber. Unbelievable. Remember what Golda Meir said in 19, 1970s? We only had peace with the Arabs and they loved their children more than they hate us. And they weren't blowing themselves up back then like this. Israel, Israel bashing is the only cause that unites natural enemies and ideologies, and ideologies that oppose each other. This is a very bizarre phenomenon, which I know you get in South Africa, I'm sure. You get it everywhere in the world today. This is, remember the Durban conference? This was a conference on, on against racism and human rights, which turned into the largest anti-Israel rally ever held on the planet Earth, where every person who showed up in Durban, I'm going to be there in two days, got a copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You guys know what that is? The famous forgery written in 1901 by the Russian secret police about how the rabbis get together every hundred years to plan the next, you know, hundred years of Jewish control of the world. How do you know it's a forgery besides we know it's a forgery? Anyone who thinks a group of rabbis in a room could agree on anything does nothing about the Jewish people. <laughs> could you, but do you guys know how warped that is? On a conference on racism, you're handing out the protocols? Crazy stuff. And here you see, this is a, a all-parliamentary inquiry into anti-Semitism from England. He said, the most worrying discovery of this inquiry is that anti-Jewish sentiment is entering the mainstream, appearing in everyday conversations of people who consider themselves neither racist nor prejudiced. Look down below, this is the same report. The left, in particular, sees itself as immune from anti-Semitism, which it considers the exclusive providence of the xenophobic right. The reality is the exact opposite. The strangest alliance existing in the world today is what I call the Red-Green Alliance. What's the Red-Green Alliance? This is the green side of it. This is the red side of it, excuse me. Who the red? The left in Europe and in America, by the way, you see the Democratic Party today, that is made up of liberals, the, the LBG, you know, the gay lesbian population. These are people, obviously, who would be very comfortable living in an Islamic country like Saudi Arabia or Iran. <laughs> but the only place, I've seen it live with my eyes, where you get a body pierced, you know, lesbian activist wearing kafir around her neck, holding up a sign screaming next to a jihadi Muslim student is what? What's the one thing that they'll agree on? That we hate Israel. What do those people have in common with these people? You know, this, these are two gay students being publicly hung in Tehran. I love that picture. Look at that. He's saying smile. She's saying it's not a good picture. It's not a good picture of me. No. Anyway, the one on the right is I believe that's a woman standing in front of Ahmadinejad's car and giving him the finger. Now that takes what's what. Anyway, guys, you see how strange that is? There's even an organization in America called Queers for Palestine. You know, you know Jerusalem is, Israel is voted one of the three most, I think, gay-friendly countries in the world, Tel Aviv is. So they say Israel's hiding behind its tolerance of, of, of the, you know, the LGBT community to mask its genocidal uh, intents against the Palestinians. Queers for Palestine. One thing's for sure, guys, the pride rally is never going to be held in Ramallah <laughs> or in Gaza. Jews are the only people in the world who are held responsible for what their core religionists do. This is totally related to you guys. There's a direct connection, as Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin write in their book, which is the best book on anti-Semitism, which is anti-Zionism is unique. It's the only and only one way, it's the first form of Jew hatred to deny that it actually hates Jews. But the connection is so clear, because if you look at when the spikes in anti-Semitism, when in South Africa, when do you get spikes in anti-Semitism? When what's going on where? War in Israel. Did you see it during the Gaza Wars? I'm sure. Synagogue desecration that takes place, knocking, attacking cemeteries, any of this stuff. In Paris, they were attacking, trying to attack Jews in synagogues in Paris. The scary part is, of course, this. What's the sickest part of this image here? You have a six points of a star, the six lines of a star of David, and a swastika. Is there any sicker comparison of Jews with Nazis? Do you think this is random, guys? This is being done deliberately. What's the other scary part of this? He's a soldier. What's he wearing? A talit. Thus connecting what with what? Israel and Jews. 
There's this very clear connection. This is not a Muslim cartoon here. Martin Luther King said, when your people criticize Zionists, they mean Jews. You're talking anti-Semitism. Again, this is the U.S. State Department study. He said, frequently, no distinction is made between Zionists and Jews, regardless of whether or not the Jews are Israeli or whether or not the Jews support the policies of Israel. The two terms are used interchangeably. Such anti-Zionist discourse often employs classic demonic stereotypes for Jews. And you can see in some of the images I showed you here, you can see the convergence of typical anti-Semitic images with images of Jews. There's a very clear connection. There's a veneer of it's about Israel, but soon the mask comes off and we see it's really just another way of bashing Jews. Here's another. I hope the European Union didn't spend a lot of money to figure this out. There has been some evidence to support the view that there is some link between the number of reported anti-Semitic incidents and the political situation in the Middle East. As we'd say in America, duh. <laughs> I'm going to go through here quickly because we're running out of time here. But Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin, in an excellent book they wrote called Why the Jews, they talk about anti Semitism in the world today and they say this is the most frightening time for Jews since the Holocaust. The Jew from the Jewish perspective, the world can be divided into three kinds of countries those that hate Jews and want them dead, those that ignore this hatred and hate the haters, and America. Just one generation after nearly really seven out of ten Jews in Europe were murdered. The remnant of Jews in the New Jersey-sized Jewish state is threatened with annihilation. As in 1938, the world seems to be divided between those nations that were about to murder Jews and those that would let it happen. Might be slightly oversimplifying, but I think it's pretty accurate. You look at this list, and I'm, I could do more. I don't want it already. It's lunch is coming up. But if I left you now, like I said, you all need Prozac. But I'm not going to just to close. Number one is, why am I not worried? You think this is the first time in history they try to do this to us? What's the next holiday coming up in a few weeks? Poor, attempted genocide against the Jews. Every year at Passover, what do we do? We raise a cup. Like Lachaim, what do we say? Behishamda. And every generation they try and destroy us. This point is so big, I even made a t-shirt about it. A little bit hard to read, but this, they sell this in a lot of stores in Israel, but it's my t-shirt. It says, civilizations, nations, and empires have tried to destroy the Jewish people and their status today. Ancient Egypt, God. Philistines, God. Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Roman, and Byzantine empires. God, 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 God. Crusaders, God. Spanish Empire, God. Nazi Germany, God. Soviet Union, God. Iran with three question marks. And it says, the Jewish people, the smallest of nations, with a friend in the highest of places. So be nice. <laughs> Guys, long after the UN has turned into condominiums, we'll still be around. But we can't be passive about this. Something's going on here. But the real reason I'm not freaking out is this is too weird. You could not write this as fiction, right? I mean, if I could sum it up, I would say that the only reason, the world does not have to deal with us as victors. It prefers us as victims. You can almost create a mathematical algorithm. How many Jews are killed in a terrorist attack or a war versus how much sympathy Israel gets and how much right it has to defend itself? I literally believe that it took six million Jews dying in the Holocaust to get enough world sympathy to do what? Vote 33 to 13 on November 29, 1947 to partition Palestine. Fast forward 70 years later, the residual guilt for the Holocaust has worn off. The best way I've ever heard it said is, Germany has never forgiven the Jews for the Holocaust. The residual guilt has worn off and the world now feels, we only did it because we felt bad. Now, we don't want to feel bad anymore. That explains the perverse connection of the six lines of a swastika with a Jewish star. We only gave you a state because of what the Nazis did to you. If we turn you into the Nazis and the Palestinians into the Jews, you know better than them. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. It's a great form of therapy, right? Does anyone think I'm exaggerating? I think I nailed it pretty well. But why am I not freaking out, guys? Because bottom line, this is way too weird. Again, you could not write this fiction and have anyone believe it. Something deeper is going on. Bigger wheels are turning. Now, this is the point I want you to take away from all of this. That all of this is just a smokescreen. Israel bashing is the final form, the final excuse being used by anti-Semitists to hate the Jewish people. And therefore, we have to pull back and look at what really ultimately drives all of anti-Semitism. And without doing a whole class on that, I wanted to show you one quote from that very excellent book I've quoted before, Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin's book, Why the Jews. In my opinion, if you want to put something on your wall and frame it, whenever you read anti-Semitic news, this is what you want to read again to explain what's really going on. From its earliest days, the raison d'etre, the 
reason for being of the Jews, of Judaism, has been to change the world for the better. This attempt to change the world, to challenge the gods, religious or secular, of societies around them, and to make moral demands upon others, has constantly been a source of tension between Jews and non-Jews. We now understand why so many non-Jews have regarded the mere existence of Jews, no matter how few, as terribly threatening. The mere existence of Jews with their different values and allegiances constituted a threat to the prevailing order. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been dragging the world, kicking and screaming for 3,800 years since the time of Abraham towards a vision of values based on the idea of relationship with God and the values that come from relationship. And when evil comes into the world, guys, we're supposed to be the God squad. Our job in this world is to live and act individually and collectively in a way that inspires people. They look at us and they say, wow, look at these people. Look how they live. Look at their relationships, their families, their children, their society. We want to be like that. But if we don't do that, you know the expression in physics, nature abhors a vacuum? Vacuums will be filled with one thing or another. If we don't fill the world individually and certainly as a Jewish state, because if anything embodies the Jewish people, and it's now the place where almost half the Jews in the world live, it's the Jewish state. If we don't do that, the opposite values are going to come into the world. The opposite values are evil. What, it's an accident that the most evil people in the world, like Hitler, you know, the most crazy countries like Iran and North Korea and Venezuela, hate the Jews and hate Israel? Evil targets us first. The best way it was said by Rabbi Chaim of Volozhi, who founded the Volozhi Yeshiva in the beginning of the 19th century. This is the quote. It's short, but boy, is it to the point. He said, when Jews don't make Kiddush, Gentiles make Abdullah. And it doesn't mean Kiddush on Friday night. But he said, when literally, when we don't do our job individually, collectively as a Jewish state, and live and act in a way that is different, and a higher level, the world's going to come after us. The double standard, as crazy as it is, is exactly the way it has to be if what I'm saying is true. And the first person to say this is Bil'am, the famous non-Jewish prophet in the book of Numbers. He says, we are Am Shishkan Levado, a nation that dwells alone and is not reckoned amongst the nations. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Zionist, but the early Zionists just wanted to Leot Hoshi, God say them. We want to be like everyone else. Just sit around and have a nice country like Europe uh, is on the other side of the mid. Guys, like I said, I'm not a prophet, but I'll make one prediction. It has never been our lot to be like anyone else. Not individually and certainly not collectively. And as amazing it is, is that we have a Jewish state today. A miracle. We have the Jews in the world are living. The world is not going to leave us alone until we have a Jewish state that represents Jewish values. And we have a Jewish people, even if you're not living in that state, that lives by those values. And all of this, Israel bashing and anti-Semitism in general, is just that reminder that you Jews, you Jewish people, you have to answer to a higher authority. Which, by the way, is the motto for Hebrew national, not quite kosher meat in America. We have to answer to a higher authority. Which means that all the Hasbara we do is great. you got to support that. You know, being Zionist is great, but guys, until we do our mission, fulfill our mission individually and collectively, we're not going to get the peace. And a practical level, I would say, number one, is to close. We've got to start working on some Jewish unity here. It's crazy. There's so, many, so much infighting in the Jewish world. You're Reform, I'm Orthodox, you're Liberal, I'm Conservative, Ashkenazi, Smarty. You think in Auschwitz there were different lines for different Jews? Reform there, Conservative there. All our enemies look at us as what, guys? We're Jews. We have to start looking at ourselves the same way. That's the biggest message of all of this. And we have to take the incredible potential we have. No people on the planet Earth have contributed more for their size than Jewish people to the human race. No nation, like the little teeny state of Israel, which is a powerhouse of innovation and creativity, unbelievable, has done more for the world for its size than Israel. That's what our job is, to do more of that, to focus the incredible potential, to come together, to focus on what we have in common as a people, to support Israel, but recognize that the goal of Israel is to be a holy place, a place that represents values to the world, not just technology, but both together. And when we do that, guys, and only when we do that, do we get an end to anti-Semitism, an end to Israel bashing, peace for ourselves, and hopefully for the whole world. And we should merit to see that soon and in our days. And thank you very much.